Hi guys, just to let you know that I have a promo of another podcast that I would love for you to listen to playing at the very end of this episode. So please stay tuned until then. Hi m ms welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. It's impossible to put an exact number on the amount of stranger abductions in the US in the 1980s. Child Find, a missing children organisation, suggested the number was roughly 600 per year with the FBI reporting 67 cases and the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children holding records for 142 cases of stranger abduction. Law enforcement suggested that 95% of missing children in the 1980s were runaway teens who typically returned home within three days. The majority of the rest of that proportion are parental abductions who are in custody disputes and only a small minority of missing children are actually abducted by a complete stranger. (music) Cherry Mahan was born on the 14th of August, 1976, in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. Cherry's mother, Janice, was 16 years old at the time Cherry was born a pregnancy she later revealed was a result of a sexual assault when she was 15. Janice doted on Cherry, who was described as a friendly, talkative child, with Janice stating, We were always together. We grew up together. She was my life. Eventually, Janice married Leroy McKinney, a Vietnam veteran, and in late 1984, the family moved roughly six miles to Cabot, Winfield Township, in Pennsylvania, after deciding it would be a better place to raise children. There, Cherry attended Winfield Elementary School, about four miles away from the family's mobile home, where she was regarded as a bright, popular and happy child who loved spelling, art and drawing. Friday the 22nd of February 1985, was an unusually warm day. Janice, who was a housekeeper at a local nursing home at the time, walked eight-year-old Cherry to the bus stop, located roughly 50 feet from the bottom of their driveway. The school bus arrived, and the pair told each other they loved each other, before Cherry boarded the bus, looking forward to returning home later that afternoon, as she was going to a friend's for a sleepover. At roughly ten past four, Cherry was seen getting off the bus with three of her friends by one of the girls' mothers, who had followed the bus to drive them the rest of the way home. The three girls chatted and messed around before parting ways. From there, the friend's mother, Debbie Burke, saw Cherry walk past a bluish-green 1976 Dodge van that children stated had been following the bus and was subsequently parked near the bus stop towards the 150-yard uphill driveway to her home. Debbie said, I sat in the car and watched the kids get off. They played for a while. I made sure Cherry had walked past the car, then I drove away. I caught a glimpse of the blue van in the mirror. It was right behind me. My son saw the van too. Hearing the bus slowing to a stop at the bottom of the drive, Cherry's stepfather, Leroy, intended to walk down to meet her as the pair did every day. However, Janice deterred him and encouraged him to let Cherry walk by herself, seeing as it was a nice day. However, Cherry never made it up the driveway, and after ten minutes, the pair grew increasingly concerned and went out to look for her. A search of their driveway yielded no clues, no sign of Cherry, and most concerning of all, no footprints in the snow. The only sign that anyone had been there that afternoon was a set of tyre impressions in the soil, about 50 yards from their mobile home. Within an hour, Janice and Leroy called police to report their daughter missing. 
State police immediately jumped into action to locate Cherry, searching the farms and fields around the home off Cornplanter Road using bloodhounds and helicopters. However, bloodhounds were only able to trace Cherry's scent as far as the Dodge van. Police performed door-to-door inquiries and roughly 250 volunteers from around Butler County set off to search the area and the search continued all weekend to no avail. Quickly, Cherry's disappearance and the search for her became national news with people captivated by her and soon Cherry's face appeared on televisions across the US. The local community of Butler County raised a $39,000 reward for information that would lead to Cherry's whereabouts and the arrest of her abductor, with a local business offering a father $10,000. The possibility of Cherry being kidnapped for ransom was quickly ruled out, as was the possibility of any family members being involved in her disappearance. Her mum, stepdad and biological father have also been ruled out after passing lie detectors. Police appealed for sightings of the Dodge van that Debbie Burke witnessed parked at the bus stop and witnesses came forward to inform police they saw a vehicle matching that description in New Kensington, about 20 miles away from Winfield Township, travelling in the direction of Mount Pleasant. Other witnesses came forward to say they'd seen a blue car following the van and others informed police that the van had been repainted black a few weeks after Cherry disappeared. While a number of vans have been forensically searched by police, the van seen following the bus that day has never been identified. Within three months of her disappearance, Cherry became the first child to have her photograph printed on a postcard and distributed by the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, which was mailed to thousands of houses across the US and was also placed inside telephone and utility bills with the question, have you seen me? An artist's rendition of the Dodge van that had a snow-capped mountain and skier mural painted on both sides accompanied the picture of Cherry. This episode was made possible by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to begin monetizing your podcast, whether you're big or small. Podgo provides podcasters with a flat rate for ad space, so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member and you can too. Apply today at podgo.co to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. Janice went on to have another child, roughly four years after Cherry disappeared, named Robert. In an interview in 2005, Janice admitted she is very protective over her son. He's never, ever gone anywhere with somebody. I mean, from the time he was able to walk until this day. I go to every soccer game. I stand by the door, you know, worried that someone could come in and take him. In November 1998, Cherry's family had her declared legally deceased in order for a trust fund in her name to be transferred over to the brother she never got to meet. After the legal proceedings, she stated, When people die, you have a body. You kiss them upon the face, you put them in the ground, and you say goodbye. That's something I never had. This is not over. We'll always look for Cherry. If nothing else, she'll always be alive in our hearts. Trooper Chris Burke-Bitchler, 
who was a high school senior when Cherry vanished, says investigators have followed up hundreds of thousands of leads and that every time Cherry's case is written about or discussed on television, the police and the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children receive new tips. These tips have also been revisited by police and the FBI, and local police have been taking second or third looks at the case and any evidence they have in recent years. 23-inch binders exist full of case files and more than 4,900 pages of reports, as well as a closet full of banker boxes of checked vehicle registrations. In 2014, police looked into a tip that suggested Cherry may be alive and living under a new name in Michigan. The woman, who had been adopted, looked a lot like the age progression photo of Cherry as an adult. Unsure of her precise origins, the woman took a DNA test, which revealed she wasn't Cherry. In early 2015, on the back of a tip phoned in by a witness, police and canine units descended upon a property in Winfield Township. A mound of dirt that appeared to be different to the rest of the terrain was excavated by five Mercyhurst College forensic anthropologists and graduate students. However, nothing was found. In 2018, Janice received an anonymous, handwritten letter detailing Cherry's killer, her murder, the motive for the murder, and where her body could be found. Janice handed the letter over to the police. However, in an interview in 2020, police said they worked closely along the FBI to investigate the note, even searching a piece of land the letter detailed, but once again, the letter proved fruitless. Janice is desperate to know what happened to her daughter. I have resigned myself to the fact that Cherry is okay, whether she's dead or alive. If she's dead, my family is taking care of her. If she's alive, someone else is taking care of her. All I pray for now is to know one way or the other. In an interview with CBS Pittsburgh in early 2020, Janice said, It's like your heart has been snapped in half and it will never go back together again. It's a torment. I've been tormented since the day she was taken. Is she alive? Is she not alive? Is she okay? Is she not okay? Is she with somebody? Are they taking care of her? Are they not taking care of her? Does she miss me? Does she want me? Does she know me? These things run in my head every single day of my life. As of the day of recording, Cherry Mahan is still missing, and her case remains open, with police detailing their refusal to close the case for as long as she could be recovered or a suspect prosecuted, with Trooper Burke Bitchler stating, quote, she deserves to be found, end quote. The National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children will also not close the case until she is found or her remains recovered. At the time of her disappearance, Cherry Mahan was eight years old, four foot two inches tall, and roughly 68 pounds. She was described as a Caucasian female, with brown hair, hazel eyes, and pierced ears. She was last seen wearing a grey coat, a blue denim skirt, blue leg warmers, and beige boots. If you have any information relating to Cherry's disappearance, you are urged to contact Pennsylvania Police's Missing Person Unit on 724-284-8100. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. As a patron, for just for just $2 a month, you get access to episodes early and ad-free, and you get a sticker sent to you. The link to my Patreon can be found in my show notes. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to 
murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have an amazing few weeks, stay safe, and I'll see you all in two weeks for another episode. Hi guys, I'm John. And I'm Frank. And we're the hosts of a general discussion comedy show out of Brooklyn, New York called The Basement Surge. Where every Monday we drop new episodes about all the different stuff we like, such as movies, video games, being a dad, basically anything that pops in our heads. The Basement Surge is available to listen to on every podcast platform there is. Including Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Basement Surge. Check out our official website at www.thebasementsurge.com for more info. Of upcoming episodes and all the magic that we come up with. All right? And that's it. Anything else? Tune the f*** in.